just how thankful thankful I am to be here with other creatives sharing and expressing and um, being able to still have this outlet so I appreciate y'all my name is Iwalani and I go by the sunflower lioness and you can follow me on any social media with that handle I'm gonna play some original songs just me and my guitar and I hope you enjoy uh, this first song is called in your eyes All of our young lives We search for someone to love Someone make us complete Someone sent from above, but they say, love don't come easy, if it do, then beware, can't deny this feeling we share, it's so strong, so scared, all the while I've been wondering it somewhere, somehow. Thank y'all. Yes, I little throw a little homage to Cindy Law for that in there and the end. Yes, big up. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, you can go ahead and follow me on social media at the Sunflower Lioness. Um, I'm an acoustic musician. I also make uh, beats and uh, you know music producer, music production kind of stuff. So you'll find a mix of things on 
my band camp. Thank you for dropping a link in the chat there. Um, yeah, so the most current thing I have out is a digital dance release. It's going to be like an electronic uh, dance instrumental album. But then I also have a lot of my acoustic guitar music on that site. And I also do kids music because I am a children's educator. So I'm going to just play a couple songs that I do uh, for the family friendly kind of kind of feels. Um, I don't you know, I'm going to get away from calling them kids songs because a lot of adults enjoy these songs too, so I'm going to call them family friendly. You feel me? So for the kids at heart, for the educators out there, for people who love kids and have kids, no kids, or just, you know, feel like a kid, want to feel like a kid again yourself, um, these songs are very near and dear to my heart. And it, this is something new and different for me because I am a part of a duo and we go by the name of Everyday Party. Um, but my music collaborator, collaborator, best friend, bandmate, and sister just passed away in June from cancer. And so now I'm a solo act representing for us. Um, and I haven't played any of these songs by myself ever. So this is, thank you for bearing with me. I'm, I might be a little emotional, but I'm gonna put it out there because these are awesome songs and she was an amazing songwriter and we collaborated together. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna play a song that, we wrote together, it's called Sunshine Voyage. Um, and my friend who passed away, her name is Monica. She, Monica Hastings Smith, I don't know if anyone knows her in the Oakland community, but she was a very, very uh, big cultural icon. Oh, still is, you know, even with her passing, she is a cultural icon in the Oakland community. Monica Hastings Smith was drummer, educator, um, musician, mother, friend sister to so many and me myself included and most recently my roommate and most closest friend and confidant so i'm representing for us the duo everyday party she's going to be here with me in spirit i'm going to sing her parts and i'm going to sing my parts and it's just going to flow this song's called sunshine voyage and actually this song is on my band camp um the release we have on there is called Sunshine Voyage is the name of the album, um, and there's uh, like seven or eight really amazing, dope songs for fam the family-friendly genre. All right, here we go. And thank y'all for the love. I feel y'all love in the chat. Thank you. All right, Monica, come on down with us. Yeah, we're going to party, everyday party. That's why we named ourselves Everyday Party, because we need to live every day like it's a party. That's why we came up with that name. Okay, here we go. We're sailing to the land of positive, where they'll have a lot of love to give. That's where I live, do you wanna go? Come on, come on, let's go. Put on your swimsuit, put on your hat, put on your neon fanny pack. I got the water, I got the snacks. Come on, come on, let's go. We're gonna roll, roll. Row, row, row. We're gonna row this boat along. We're gonna sing our favorite song. Oh, I hope the wind is strong. Think of paradise, lemonade and ice. Going on a sunshine voyage is nice. Guitar in the back. Don't forget your hat. Going on a sunshine voyage like that. Think of paradise, lemonade and ice. Going on a sunshine voyage is nice. Guitar in the back. Don't forget your hat. Going on a sunshine voyage like that. Here we go out on the bay. Sunshine voyage takes all day. Call your friends, hootie hoo yo yo. Come on, come on, let's go. The water's smooth and the weather's fine. Let's put town the fishing line. We'll catch something by supper time. Come on, come on, let's go. We're gonna row, 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 row. We're gonna row this boat along. We're gonna sing our favorite songs. Oh, I hope the wind is strong. Think of paradise, lemonade and ice. Going on a sunshine voyage is nice. Guitar in the back. Don't forget your hat. Going on a sunshine voyage like that. Think of paradise. Lemonade and ice. Going on a sunshine voyage is nice. Guitar in the back. Don't forget your hat. Going on a sunshine voyage like that. Take me to the beach. Take me to the lake. Take me to the mountain. Don't be late. Take me on a sunshine voyage there. Yeah. Come on, come on, let's go. 
Take me to the oceans, take me to the rivers, take me down to where the sun can deliver. Positive vibes and positive feelings. Come on, come on, let's go. We're gonna roll, 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 roll with me, everybody. We ain't gonna roll this boat along. We ain't gonna sing our favorite songs. Oh, I hope the wind is strong. Think of paradise, lemonade and ice, going on a sunshine voyage is nice. Guitar in the back, no big in your hat, going on a sunshine voyage like that. Think of paradise, lemonade and ice, going on a sunshine voyage is nice. Guitar in the back, no big in your hat, go, yeah. Voyage, sunshine voyage, yeah. Sunshine voyage, sail along. Just sail along, come on. Voyage, sunshine voyage, yeah. Sunshine voyage, sail along. That's what you're doing, just sail along, come on. Voyage, sunshine voyage, yeah. Sunshine voyage, sail along. That's what you're doing, just sail right along, right? Voyage, yeah, don't forget your hat. Voyage, sunshine voyage, yeah. good was good was good <laughs> thank you i appreciate you guys listening to that yes okay that one's called sunshine voyage go check it out on my band camp um i'm gonna play another song that i sing with the kids this one's called rock elephant let's see let's see let's see all right this is another song that me and monica developed together Everybody rock with me. Everybody do your thing. Everybody dance and sing. Everybody jump and swing. We gonna rock, rock, rock. Yeah, we gonna rock you right out of your seat right now. We gonna rock right now, ready rock. Yeah, we gonna rock you right out of your seat right now. When you want, guess you're blowing my mind. I want you rockin' with me all of the time When we bubble, yeah, you make me feel fine When you wind up, when you wind up Rock your body, baby, do what it do ha. We gonna party till the party is through My people in the back come this way I know you wanna get down at the end of your day You can have what you really want And you know that You can have what you really want Darling, I want to show you that What you really want You blow my mind, baby Like all the time, baby Rock, 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 my little baby Get on the dance floor That's what she said Rock, 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 my little baby Oh, we knocking down Grease Grease Oh, that's what she said And the show must go on I'm gonna keep going <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> it's probably getting humid in here because my duct tape is about <laughs> My people moving now, and everybody can't get down. No matter what you came to do, I just came to dance with you. We're gonna rock, rock, rock. Yeah, we're gonna rock it right out of your seat right now. We're gonna rock right now, baby, rock. Yeah, we're gonna rock it right out of your seat right now. I see you rockin', baby, doing your thing. We at the party, just not making it swing. When that beat drop, and that beat not, yes, we dropping this hit to make your body hot. When they hit the beat, yes, it make me smile. See me getting down, baby, going for mine. Everybody came up in there just to have a good time. I see you over there, you and I like how you shine. <laughs> you can have what you really want, and you know that. What you really want, want to show you that. What you really want, you blow my mind, baby, like all the time. Get ready, baby. Rock, 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 my little baby. Get on the dance floor, that's what she said. Rock, 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 my little baby. Get on the dance floor, that's what she said. Stomp your feet like an elephant now. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Your feet like an elephant now. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Swing your trunk like an elephant now. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Swing your trunk like an elephant now. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Rock, 
rock, rock, rock, my little baby. Rock, 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 my little baby. Rock, 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 my little baby. Get on the dance floor. That's what she said. <laughs> yes, we're knocking down green screens over here. We're knocking down the whole room. Yes. That's how it goes down in the Zoom concerts. Ha <laughs> ha. Mm. Yes. Oh my gosh, what's that? My SoundCloud? Oh, I haven't been on my SoundCloud in a minute. Okay, okay. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Bandcamp. I don't have as many things on SoundCloud. I have a few things, but a uh, majority of my stuff is on Bandcamp. I do have a couple of releases on Spotify, like more of the dance stuff, but I'm working on getting an accumulated collection all on digital with the kids' music, the acoustic folk rock, and the digital stuff all combined. So, you know, but you can definitely find me on social media uh, through all of those links. The sunflower Linus. All right. All right. Um, do I have time for another one or is that it? Yeah, good. Okay, cool. Let's do another one. All right. This one's called Find a Way. All right. Let's see. Uh, thank you, whole child. Thank you, Jan. What's good? Yes. What's up, Andrew? Ha <laughs> ha. Right. The green screens. Oh my gosh. Yvette. Thank you. I'm just get tapping in the chat. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, this next song is called Find a Way. So I wrote this song kind of as a rock hip hop song. And then over the years, I kind of um, revamped it as kind of like a reggae, reggae style. OK, here we go. It's called Find a Way. Standing around, looking for something, waiting around, waiting for what? Don't really know. So turn my heart so I can break new ground. Yo, broken dreams from my people, their past. Shadow mirrors, looking to the past. A freedom to find the spirit, yeah. And I hope y'all hear it. I got a strange, I got a strange feeling. Everything that I believe in, everything that I've been seeking. Gonna be okay, okay. But every time that I look for a reason, just bring the changing of season. So, with the storm that it's bringing, I got to find a way, a new 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 way, yeah, a new way, a new way. A new way. This life might go, so I stay on this road and keep on flowing. But when I look around at this rhetoric I found, refuse to be fooled, cause I'm holding it down, I'm no slowing down. No new way to find a new way, new way, got to find a new way, a new way. in your face whose lies will you embrace it don't know you don't know do ya you don't know do ya so who gonna run this red race and when they try to shove it in your face whose lies will you embrace it I don't know when you don't know do ya
Yes. Thank you. All right. I love the contrast, right? This half green screen, half <laughs> canvases of art <laughs> and guitars. Yes. In my bed. Thank you for coming into my room. I have a very intimate experience today with y'all. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Again, you can follow me on social media at the Sunflower Lioness. I love to make new friends and new connections and people who love good music and connect with other creators. So, yes, thanks for following and have a beautiful weekend, everybody. So everybody unmute yourselves and let the lioness hear your applause because that was just so badass. That was so good. Yay! Thank you! Thank you! My goodness. That was awesome. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. My Connie, that was oh so goodness. spot on. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Right on. Uh, wow, just uh, <laughs> amazing. I, I posted her band camp, not her sound club, but her band camp in those chat screen. My bad there. I was send I, money I, her I, way, please. I, yeah, but I, I always forget about band camp. I should not forget about band camp. Hey, I'm all over band camp. Don't forget about band camp. Yes, I, I, I know. I, I know that's where, that's where yeah, yeah. Yeah. Band camp that's, Friday, that's, that's, I know that's where the grassroots is, and I, I, I'm band not camp a, Friday. I've been out of the musical scene too long. I apologize. Oh my goodness gracious, we are getting right. we are. Okay, let's. Wow, we're getting a lot of outside sound from somewhere. That's okay. Okay, uh, awesome. So uh, that is that 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 is the sunflower lioness, and I, I can't believe like that. That's the last we'll see of her in this festival, but it's not the last we'll see oh. of her at the show. But it's just, I, I just having that moment there. But it's two p.m. So now we hand it over to Audrey Williams and Ancestral Futures. Yes. Um, and uh, and Audrey, tell us you just give us a quick little intro as soon as you got it, and you can get your show going whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. So I'm just going to read our um, description for our event here. So what we have is four amazing Black speculative fiction writers, and the title for our show this afternoon is "Of Light and Shadow: The Luminous Fantastic." And the reason it's called that is because wait till you hear these amazing luminaries and what they have to share. Amazing new work. I'm so happy that everyone could make it. So this is a reading from the growing collective, collective of Black speculative literary artists. Speculative literary artists create fiction, poetry, nonfiction, graphic novels, comics, VR, AR, multimedia. We do it all. We're content creators. But the writing genres range from the magical, the fantastical, to science fiction, to steampunk, cyberpunk, Afrofuturism, Afro surrealism, Southern Gothic horror, and more things than I can even name, guys. Like, we're doing it all out here. So, our featured members today are um, our curated group who are representing membership in various literary organizations. For example, our own local Afro Surreal Writers Workshop of Oakland. Uh, we have representation from Voodoo Knots, which we'll hear about a little later. The Association of Black and Brown Writers, Trey Keeve the Third, holding it down, and um, Ancestral Futures Lab. So I curated this reading and I hope you all enjoy. We're gonna kick it off with Desi Lank up first. Desi, are you on, on track? There she is. All right, so let me just read a little intro. Let's do a mic check. Desi, you want to? You, you there? Can you hear me? Yes, perfection. All right, lady, I'm about Great. to introduce you. So, All right. Ms. Ms. Desi Lank, her fiction is steeped in surrealism, while her nonfiction is rooted in the tangible solutions nonprofits and sustainable businesses provide. Her blog, if you haven't seen the blog, go to Outcast Mag, celebrates the unique contributions that artists, eco-friendly business owners, and nonprofits offer to their communities. She's currently working on her first novel, which you can find an excerpt of in the upcoming anthology from the Afro Surreal Writers, the new transmissions from the Dark Fantastic Continuum. That got put on pause for COVID, y'all, but it's still coming, okay? Don't get it twisted. That's coming up, so keep your eye out <laughs> for that. I have to say, I met Desi through the Afro Surreal Writers Workshop. We've read together at Litquake and a bunch of other places. So looking forward to what you have to share, Desi. I'm going on mute. It's all you. Awesome. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. All right. So today I'm going to be reading from Midnight and Indigo's fifth issue. Um, and 
it's kind of crazy because the story for the like the characters have changed and the setting has changed but i've always had that central question of are we how do we love unconditionally while also maintaining healthy boundaries and i think there's a few answers to that but it just seeing it in its final form with this answer is just an amazing feeling so i'm going to be reading from that i'm going to start um a little bit in so i want you guys to picture a chain link fence and there's no bar at the top so it kind of slopes down a little bit and there are three children twin brother and sister and their neighbor ebony and so far the girls have been on the fence bouncing on it now the little um the twin brother is coming up right now and he's asking to go on it so i'm going to start from there okay pushing down with the added weight allowed them to plunge closer to the ground, but just before touching it, the fence catapulted them into the air. Their grip ripped from the metal and they flung into the sky. Beads of sweat on their skin evaporated as they ascended past the power lines ornamented with Chuck Taylors. At their peak, they grabbed bits of cloud and it dissolved in their hands like cotton candy on the tongue. Miss Patricia stood and squinted up at their bodies plastered against the sapphire sky. The kids beheld the castle of clouds surrounding them. Maybe it was because they, she was closer to the sun, but Ebony saw everything clearly, especially her best friend. From up here, Ebony acknowledged that she looked forward to the knock at the door from the twins every day. With the sunset came a night of spoon feeding her dad yogurt mixed with crushed pills and getting up every few hours to check on him. The twins' faces lifted the denseness of the night. Ebony wanted to tell them this, but the words couldn't rise from her, so she looked at their neighborhood. From up high, it had a golden hue. Amara recalled the time her family went on a road trip to the beach, when they still did spur the moment trips, when they were still together. They drove with the windows down, so Amara continuously removed hair from her face to see her parents in the front, holding hands. Shuggy Otis's freedom flight repeated on the cassette player as they flew by town after town. Once there, she couldn't take her eyes off the body of water in the distance. Flint along with the other kids, played in the water while Amara sat in the sand watching the waves roll towards her and crash to the shore, then pulled back out. Eventually, Flint realized that Amara wasn't around, so he'd run to her, reporting on how fun it was, asking her to join. The clouds around her now looked just like the waves breaking on the beach, except they have paused here, never settling. Flint found his favorite castle, the largest one complete with a throne. He attempted to go to it, but found his body moved at a slower pace from up here. The kids realized there was more time within the expanse of time they already have. Slipping into a sliver of a second, they glanced to the past assured because it brought them here. It made them certain of what was to come because if they reached this form of paradise, there must be other forms out there. They got so high and no matter how much they explained that memory, no one can grasp the magnitude of that day. People listened, but with the same response of telling your dream to someone, like they are twice removed or it's not real. But even though they couldn't tangibly show someone, it determined every decision they made later in life. Sometimes when Amara looked at Flint, she saw that moment replaying in the reflection of his eyes. If it weren't for what happened next, the three of them would forever try to reach those heights again. They came down hard. So hard, in fact, no one had the opportunity to grab hold of the gate so the jagged top sliced the backside of their legs. On their backs, they looked up at where they once were. The gate, meant to keep the neighbors separated, failed and the children collected themselves in Miss Patricia's yard. Amara sat up and saw that she was not bleeding yet, but the stinging started with the clean cuts running from her thighs to ankles. The blood must still be blue, she thought. Ebony remained on the cool grass, focusing on the fact that Miss Patricia's grass was always green, while everyone else's yard was like hay. What made her grass so different when the chain link fence was the only thing that separated the yard? Blood emerged from the slices, and Ebony sat up to wipe the lines revealing pink meat or skin once protected. Where did you guys go? What was it like up there? I've never seen anything like it. Are you all right? Miss Patricia asked the entire way over to them. Flint's lips shook and his face crumbled into a cry. He didn't realize how bad he was hurt until someone asked him. Amara, terrified that she'd be blamed, told him that it didn't hurt that much. She tried to calm him by promising him some of her candy. It didn't work. Amara always thought they were similar. But after that day, she realized that fear trumped the pain for her, while pain made him forget about fear. The three ran. 
went home where his mom would be just getting off from work. She'd be frustrated with him for trying something so dangerous and give him a whooping. The girls ran to Ebony's house because her dad was bedridden, so they'd be able to hide the cut. Blood oozed from their legs with each stride. Once at Ebony's, the girls started to the bathroom, ripped toilet paper from the roll, knocking over the pla moldy plastic cup that held toothbrushes. Her dad heard and asked from the dark bedroom what was going on. Everything's fine, Papa, Ebony yelled. Ebony closed her bedroom door. The girls' eyes locked, and they laughed hesitantly. Did that, did, <laughs> blah, blah. did that just happen? Amara asked. I don't even know, Ebony answered, shakily handing Amara a wet piece of tissue. They dabbed their legs and made fans out of newspaper to cool the cuts. Amara wished she never let Flint onto the fence that day. She never wanted to go on the gate again, but the pain kept bringing Flint back. She'd find him trying to recreate the magic of the fence, but now he had to do it alone, and it was never the same. He no longer followed Ebony and Amara around, asking to join their game. They knew where to find him. Ebony's dad died a month later, and a woman Amara had never seen before came to pick Ebony up. The woman placed her hand on Ebony's back, urging her into the black car. From her yard, Amara called over to her, and Ebony turned, put her hand up, and smirked. Then she was ushered into the car. As they drove away, Amara felt the pull of Ebony disappearing from her life. Amara blamed the gate, even though deep down she knew there were other factors at play. Factors she didn't quite understand yet, but felt their presence. Amara tried to get Flint into other things, but he only cared for the fence. Watching Flint attempt to recreate that day pained Amara, and one day she looked away and focused on the future. As they got older, their differences solidified their distance. Flint still reached for that bit of cloud, but gravity snapped him down at a faster rate. Because of this, his cuts were always deeper and the scars more severe. At family gatherings, they tell Amara she is the good twin, but she, not, she hides the non-guilt that she isn't. After all, she showed the Flint to Flint. She lit the match that ignited his addiction. She ignored his late night calls when he needed a place to sleep and kept him away from the life she built. A life where her daughter wore Sunday dresses that fit with shiny shoes and lacy socks. A life where no fences were needed because her property stretched for miles. Yet she found there's something stronger than the gates she puts up. It's a bond that drills through the facades of the everyday. Something that causes her to stop whatever she's doing and know something is happening with Flint. He has the same feeling when he isn't preoccupied with the fence. In his moments of clarity, he shows up or crawls right when she's amid something heavy. These diversions from reality show her what it'd be like if Flint never went on the fence. He comes to her door and he isn't shaking or impatient. His sentences are clear and concise, so she lets them in. Amara prepares two cups of green tea with slices of lemon and honey. She goes to the living room to see him on her couch. He's reclined his arms spread out on the back side of the sofa, and he's admiring the lush backyard through the floor to ceiling windows. Amara walks up and he grabs the tea from her. Remember that time mom and dad took us to the ocean? We drove hundreds of miles and you wouldn't go in the damn water. Flint laughs, sinking back into the couch. I was fascinated and scared. I mean, by the power of it, how it came in then retreated. I didn't want to get pulled out to sea, Amara replied. Amara later learned that blood isn't blue. Veins appear so because of the way the light hits it. But she knows, she now knows there's something in blood that causes family to be drawn together as the sea is drawn out to shore. That something has the power to permit occasions like this, moments where she can peek into another reality. This entity causes the gates to occasionally bend and Flint and Amara can reach each other through the barricades that divide them. Thank you for listening. <laughs> so this is an excerpt from will you hold up the the uh book the midnight and indigo this is issue five right you guys mm -hmm. check it out yep. you can look it up i'm sorry i don't have the link ready at my fingertips for this one but we're so <laughs> excited and congratulations mm -hmm. this is your first publication is that right it is. Yes, yes you're all first of many congrats <laughs> congrats thank you thank so <laughs> one question the one question i'm gonna ask everybody um what is there something you can share? Like what inspired this story? Hmm. Well, like I said, I, I kind of had that question at the beginning. Is it possible to love someone unconditionally while also maintaining boundaries? 
Yep. And that's something that I've just been exploring within my own life, but also in other, you know, other writings of mine. So um, it's something I'm always kind of thinking on and the various ways that can show up and play out in different characters' lives. Cool. Okay, one more question. I lied. Two questions. What are you reading right now? <laughs> Anything speculative that we should know about? Ooh. Ooh. Okay, so I just started Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. I just started it yesterday. Okay. Dark Matter. Um, I don't know that. Cool. Yeah, it's like a sci-fi kind of a thing. Um, and so far it's got me hooked. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, Desi. All right, we're gonna move on to Trey Keeve. Thanks again, Desi, Thank and congrats again. All Thank right. You. All right. All right. There he is. All right, let me pull up the bio. Not that he needs any introduction. Y'all know Mr. Trey. So Trey, also known as Vernon, Keeve the Third, is a Virginia-born queer writer. They currently live and teach in Oakland. They hold an MFA from California College of the Arts, my alma mater, and a Master of Arts in Teaching Literature from Bard College. Trey's full-length collection of poetry, y'all, buy this book. It's called Southern Migrant Mixtape, okay? It was published by Nomadic Press in 2018 and was the recipient of the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award. Y'all give it up for Trey. Yes, thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna go on. Um, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I, I had an explanation for this, but now since I know you're gonna ask me this question, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna jump into reading, but I, um, I've been sitting on this idea for a while and I literally started writing this yesterday. Um, so it's not really finished. Um, so sorry if it feels like a treatment. <laughs> of the damned. They considered themselves the dwindlers or rather those that dwindled because that was how their elders spoke of this place to them before they became ancestors. Ancestors that didn't move too far from the grounds which enslaved them just to the mountains in the West, green hills that reminded them of something forgotten in crevices of earth that they thought would protect them from the anger, the anger that swelled up from the very so soil they tilled before they were free, an anger that set fire to homes and bodies, an anger that made trees heavier, an anger that came with death. They found a home in a dense thicket of forest mere miles from the Tennessee border in northern Alabama, a small collection of homes cloaked in live oak and cedar trees. The inhabitants referred to it as bird. Inhabitants who look sort of like them, just darker than the angry ones at least. Bird was made up of runaways and survivors and it welcomed these wandering dwindlers into their cottages until their own homes were built. Over time, bonds were created, families were forged and swelled over their creek beds. Their village grew into a small town by the turn of the century and kept growing until the Great War, a war that called many of them North and West children, leaving aged parents and younger siblings that they never got to see again. When war came again 20 years later, it took even more leaving the town of birds seemingly flightless until wellness came. In 1956, the Marion Wellness Center for Women opened up right outside of Bird, along a road that connected the village to Huntsville. Passersby on their way to work in the morning noticed the ground breaking, then the pouring of the foundation, and then the layering of bricks as they drove to and from work. And then a sign popped up reading the M Wellness Center for Women Coming Soon. When the large brick house with the Jeffersonian columns was finished, another sign replaced the first one, which had began to fade in the southern summer sun. And this one read the Marion Wellness Center for Women, grand opening August 18th, free services for colored women, and in parentheses, children. The women of Bird only needed Miss Lafayette whenever they needed to prepare to bring, when, when they needed to prepare to bring a child into this world or even keep one from coming in and other things that remain secrets in the confines of Miss Lafayette's four flat house, all painted haint blue. 
Before Miss Lafayette, there was Miss Yamay. And before her, there was Miss Broadleaf and the, lead, and the list goes on until Bird was just the idea of a nest cozied amongst the trees at the foot, at the foot of the Appalachian Plateau. There was always a healer amongst the community, a bearer of the white cloth. The men of Bird took whatever their wives, mothers and sisters gave them whenever they felt an ailment in their bodies. All in all, the inhabitants of Bird didn't know what a wellness center was, and they have never known wellness in a land that still tormented them for being free and black. A few years after opening its, a few weeks after opening its doors, the white nurses of Marion, the Marion Wellness, the white nurses of Marion Wellness decided to visit the hamlet down the road. Two of them set up a table outside of Hens Market while three others walked down the road to the four parallel off streets all lined with tiny houses. Miss La Lafayette missed their, missed their knock because she was still resting from a long night of doing conjure for a client from Huntsville. Four doors opened for these white women and the black women inside stepped onto their tiny porches to hear about the free offerings of, Mar of that, Mary, uh, that Marian wellness offered childbirth, natural and cesarean, a word new to many of the women of Bird and to which had to be, and which had to be explained. Dr. Marion says it's one of the safest ways to bring a child into this world, one of the nurses explained to Mrs. Thurgood as she hushed the three toddlers standing around her shins. Well, I surely don't see myself having any more kids if you ask me. Three nurses turned, the three nurses turned to each other, Dr. Marion and Dr. Marion, their brothers, do tubal legations as well, blurted the nurse who wasn't standing on the porch. It's a process that stops women's ability to get pregnant, and it can be reversed if you ever want to have kids again. Miss Thurgood stood in silence for a moment. Something about that don't sit right with me, broke the silence and fell amongst the women, and she began closing her door. Thank you for stopping by. Well, at least think about coming to our polio vaccine giveaway. We will be giving away free Philco radios with every vaccine. Her door stopped closing. The vaccine folks are talking about in Huntsville. You got enough for my kids. We have enough for everyone, said one nurse. And radios too, said the other. When is vaccine day, asked Miss Thurgood. This coming Saturday, ma'am. How many other women under 50 live in Bird, ma'am? Miss Thurgood waved, <clears throat> Miss Thurgood waved the, waved the children deeper into her house and stared into the ether, counting on her fingers and other things, 17 including myself. Why do you ask? Polio can cause birth defects and we surely want to prevent, um, that we surely want to prevent. We want to make sure women still able to give birth are surely vaccinated. Our motto down at the clinic, <clears throat> women and children first. This nurse giggled after she spoke. We're going to keep knocking on doors, but will you, Help us spread the word about Saturday. Miss Thurgood nodded in agreement and closed her door. On Saturday morning, the women of Bird woke up. The mothers dressed their children in clothes that they wore on previous Easter's and Christmases and piled them into cars and the backs of pickup trucks and even onto wagons that were pulled by mules and horses. Dolly May and Magnolia both hitched a ride for most of the trip on the back of Miss Miner's wagon, but asked to be dropped off two miles from the center so they could smoke cigarette, smoke the cigarettes Dolly had secreted into her purse. They were also tired of Miss Miner's sons eyeing them. They were going into their senior year at Alabama, at the Alabama State. Hello? Yeah. Am I, is it time? Uh, looks really good. The only uh, thing, someone, uh, sorry, uh, someone needs to mute. I'm sorry, yeah. Trey. So can we mute everyone? Uh, I don't know if we should maybe move up. Visual Art Circle. You can unmute Trey, it's good to go. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, um, they were going into their senior years at Alabama State College for Negroes, and it was suggested that all students should get the vaccine before returning for fall and winter classes. Um, they only given this vaccine to women and children first everywhere. 
I don't know. I don't be knowing anything about the world outside of Bird. When we come home from school, I haven't even seen a newspaper since we left the dormitory. We told Jacob and Emmett that we were going to visit them in Huntsville this summer. My daddy offered to take us whenever we wanted to go into town. What we look like getting into your daddy's truck after getting our hair and clothes all mussed up by them boys. The two of them laughing and held cigarette smoke. The wellness center was much larger than any of them had thought. It looked like a testament from the road, but up close it was even larger and the front doors were left open and it made Miss Thurgood feel like she was being swallowed and she hesitated in directing her children inside. But she wanted to assure that her children were vaccinated. She heard that many white people assumed that the virus was coming from black people and it was causing anger to rise to the surface again. At noon, the front doors to the center closed and one of the nurses rung a bell that echoed throughout the marble foyer and silenced the crowd and said, follow me. Everyone followed her down a short hallway into the large dining room. I hope you don't mind that we brought a catered lunch for you all. Us nurses found out about Herman Shaw's barbecue and we just been looking for any reason to eat it as much as possible. Us nurses and doctors here really wanted to thank you for coming to the wellness center and getting the vaccine. As we are given vaccines, we'll be telling you about our other services, many of them free to you colored women because of government funding. There are only five of us nurses, so we'll be bringing you in by tables. When it's your turn, you will go to the room next door and two lines um, in the two lines to the left are for the children and the two lines to the right are for the women. We ask that you hang around for at least one hour after your children have, after you and your children have been vaccinated, just in case you exhibit any possible severe side effects. Mild side effects that everyone may experience are drowsiness, joint pain, and low fever. After 24 hours, you'll be in the fine and in the clear. Your Philco radio will be handed to you as you leave. Ms. Thurgood did not like the idea of being separated from her children, was thinking to speak to the nurse about it, but when her table was called and she saw that there was no partition or other obstruction blocking her view from her children as they stood in the line across from her, she felt better. Herman Shaw's is all right, Magnolia said to Dolly May. They shared a table with Miss Jackson. I like Fannie Lou's better, but you know them white nurses ain't going to going into that part of Huntsville. You know that's right, Magnolia said. Dolly leaned, uh, Dolly leaned in and ordered to whisper in Magnolia's ear. Miss Shirley know her ass is well over 50. She just want that free radio. But you don't see Miss King over there in that black beard covering up her whole gray head. The two of them burst into laughter that echoed in the hall. A nurse walked over to them and told them that it was their turn. They stood up, leaving their plates at the table and walked to the doors that opened, um, that opened to the next room. A room that mimicked the dining hall, but with no tables, only two nurses stations on opposite sides of the room with two nurses each. When it was Magnolia and Dolly's turn, they both sat in the, down in the chairs. A nurse sanitized Magnolia's right arm and the other Dolly's left and they were both jabbed. When it was over, they stood up and Magnolia asked if they could explore the gardens in the back. The nurse seemed hesitant, but said, you just stay with inside of the windows just in case you have a bad reaction. In the garden, they both lit cigarettes behind the blossoming rows of Sharon Bush. Dolly felt lightheaded, but assumed it was tobacco. She saw Magnolia lift her hand to her head and the next thing she knew she was opening her eyes and, sun, and on sunlight and white paint burned them shut. She lifted her arms to rub her eyelids, but they were heavy and sore. She turned her head and saw Mrs. Thurgood asleep on the bed next to her and she turned to her left and saw Magnolia and, the other, and other women in beds beyond her. She opened her mouth to speak, but her throat was dry and it burned. She was only able to say mag before a coughing fit took over her chest and a nurse ran to her side. Dolly, Dolly Bradleaf, is it? Here's some water. The nurse picked up a glass on the side table to her bed and held it to Dolly's mouth as she drank. The water was not refreshing, just wet and, and warmed by the sun coming through the windows. When she was able to speak, she asked, what happened? You and 16 other women had really bad reactions to the vaccine. How long was I asleep? You arrived here yesterday afternoon for the vaccine. It's Sunday morning now. 
Dolly tried to prop herself up but felt a sharp pain in her lower abdomen. Her hands felt two bandages right above her pelvis. What did you do to me? The vaccine caused some bleeding in your abdomen, same as all the other women here. The doctors needed to make sure everything was okay in there. Don't worry, you'll heal up just fine. You won't feel any pain after about a week and then you could go about your regular life, just no heavy lifting for a month or so. Dolly's eyes got heavy again and she fell back to sleep and woke up to Mrs. Thurgood yelling and asking about her children. Don't worry, ma'am. Your husband Ronald is his name, right? Well, he came here looking for you after you didn't make it home and we told him what happened and he took your kids home. We assured him that you'd be ready to leave around 1 p.m. today and he said he would be here to pick you up. My kids all right though? Yes, ma'am. None of the kids had any bad side effects when, when they left. They were just worried about you, but you, you're awake and going to be all right. Just be careful of those bandages. The doctor had to make two tiny incisions to drain some blood and make sure all was well. You and everyone else are going to be fine after a little rest and some healing. Just don't go lifting those toddlers until about, um, about this time next month. Dolly turned to Magnolia. She was sitting up with her arms crossed. Dolly, we need to get out of here, she said. I don't feel right about this. One by one, the 17 women got picked up by family members. Magnolia rolled home with Dolly's parents who had been waiting outside in their car since the night before. They let us in to come see you briefly, but every one of y'all was asleep. They wouldn't let us stay inside, so we just stayed in the car. 17 women from Bird, aside from Miss Shirley and Miss King, were given a minor tranquilizer instead of vaccines. When these women began passing out, a nurse opened a door to a long hallway lined with stretchers and the women were loaded up and taken one by one to an operation room where two doctors already masked and ready for surgical procedure made two tiny incisions in each woman and removed portions of their fallopian tubes. After that Saturday in August, the inhabitants of birds stayed away from the wellness center, thinking and knowing something was strange about what happened to those 17 women they all seemed fine and healthy, but a fear developed in them whenever they caught a glimpse of the two scars as they bathed or got dressed. And, they fe and a fear developed in Miss Lafayette when 15 of the 17 women started visit visiting her months later with pregnancies that all seemed further along than the first trimesters they should have been in. A fear that became visceral when Dolly May and Magnolia retained, returned home early from school pregnant and both claiming to be virgins. The nurses at the wellness center had no knowledge of these pregnancies. Their eyes were no longer set on bird, but the other towns in the Black Belt, they needed to think of new ways to execute their mission since their windows on using the polio vaccine as a mask was closing. They knew they were doing God's work in eradicating the race of Cain. On January 18th, Exactly five months after those 17 women a bird had their fallopian tubes unknowingly slipped, snipped, they all went into labor at 1 a.m. in the morning. Miss Lafayette could only tend to the first woman who made it to her doorstep. The 16 other women had no choice but to get into cars, trucks, and wagons and make their way to the Marion Wellness Center. The nurses heard the banging on the door and it woke them from their sleep and they rose and covered themselves in robes. When they opened the front door and saw the women going into labor, they lost sight of the religion, their religion and feared what they had to do ne next. Let these women in. <clears throat> Vernon, how dare you? Oh my God. <laughs> What, Vernon? Okay, we're gonna talk about this offline. You know, I had a tubal ligation earlier this year. I can't, you're messing with me so hard right now. I just can't, wow. All right, okay, so speak on it, please. How did you get the inspiration for this? Um, it's called Of The Damn. So I like, I'm just like me writing, I'm trying to write horror stories and me writing horror stories right now is just me like, um, what would a black version of this look like? <laughs> um, so um, I was thinking of what would a black version of Village of the Damned look like? Um, wow. I'm looking in the chat and I see <laughs> B. Sharice is talking about Mississippi appendectomy. Did this happen? Is this historical fiction? Are you or or history? I mean, like you know, like 
like I've been, I had to do research, of course, on like four sterilizations for this. Right, right. Um, like, so like it, it, it is a thing. It did happen. They used to call them Mississippi appendectomies. Yes, that's what she put in the chat. Wow. <laughs> All right. You're going to make me do my research on this. <laughs> Vernon. Okay. Tell us what, what are you reading, sir? I'm um, reading. Um, I don't know if y'all were like feeling it, but like um, I was. I'm reading Shirley Jackson also right now. Shirley Jackson's <laughs> sundial. Um, so yeah. like, I, like I love how Shirley Jack. Like you know, she just like names the character. Really doesn't give us a description. Um, I kind of just really like that. So I've just been like trying to do that. Um, but literally, like, um, yeah, I just started writing this yesterday. So I'm glad it's going somewhere. But it is like. I have to keep stopping to do research because, um, you know, I don't want it to be right. too bullshit. Um, and that research is taxing. Um, I can imagine. But wait, you did all that since yesterday. Um, yeah, I started right. I had I've had this idea for a while, but I started right. Yesterday was a teacher work day. So uh-huh. like I had to be on Zoom for half the day <laughs> and I got to work on this for the rest. Of, and I literally stopped typing like um, like at one fifty. OK. <laughs> wow, as always, impressive, impressive. Trey Keeve the third, y'all. All right, give it up one more time. And then we're going to move along to our third reader. Okay. Yes. All right. So next up, we have Yvette in Delovu. Did I say it right? I have to check. Uh, it's in Delovu. Oh, thank you. Your accent. Oh, your beautiful voice. All right. Oh, thank you. So, okay, I'm going to try again. Yvette in Delovu. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. She is a Zimbabwean Surangano. Yeah. Is this correct? Surangano, which means storyteller. Her debut short story collection, Swimming with Crocodiles from the University Press of Kentucky in spring 2023, forthcoming. This has already won the 2021 UPK New Poetry and Prose Series Prize. Yvette is pursuing her MFA currently at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where she also teaches in the writing program. She has already taught at Clarion West Writers Workshop, which I'm still trying to get into the workshop, so just so y'all know, okay? (laughs) She's taught at the Clarion West uh, Writers Workshop online and earned her BA at Cornell University. Her work has been supported by fellowships from Tin House Workshop, Breadloaf Writers Workshop, and the New York State Summer Writers Institute. Yvette has received the 2017 Cornell University George Harmon Cox Award for Poetry, selected by Sally Wen Mao, and was the 2020 fiction winner of the Columbia Journal's Women's History Month special issue. She is the co-founder of Voodoo Knots Summer Workshop for Black science fiction fantasy writers, speculative fiction fantasy writers. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Fantasy and Science Fiction, Tor.com, The Columbia Journal, Faya's Black Speculative Literary Magazine, Mermaids Monthly, and the Coeli Journal. She is currently at work on a novel. And I just have to say, I met Yvette through Voodoo Knots, and I just want to hype up Voodoo Knots for a second because it is the first Black speculative organization I've been a part of that is such a beautiful interweaving of African-American, Black Americans, and people on the continent. So there's African writers and there's African-American writers, and we're all writing all the things. So thank you. And y'all, please give it up for Miss Yvette. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm so glad to be in community with the readers today. Um, I'll be reading from a short story from my collection called From the Side of the Rock. It's also forthcoming from the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, but I don't know which issue it's going to be in yet. Um, And it's uh, Afro surrealism. From the side of the rock. They take Jabu's eyes on a Tuesday morning. The snowflakes fall with an obscene tenderness outside. We're inside a sterile government building that looks like a cross between a DMV and a church. The building seems to be designed to keep any warmth out, lest the critter critters inside get comfortable. It is the kind of cold that takes hold of your bones and refuses to let go. My friend Jabu is a painter. With a stroke of a brush, he can put rainbows to shame. He likes to paint our homelands beautiful landscapes and skies. The naturalization priest lays a hand over Jabu's eyes, and just like that, Jabu's beautiful brown eyes vanish as if they've never existed. 
the spot where his eyes used to be as smooth as an arm. Jabu collapses to the ground and retches on all fours into a plastic bin. Jabu isn't the first to vomit during a naturalization ceremony. So the priests always have those little plastic bins stationed at every corner of the building. The naturalization priest's face sours as if he's seen a roach running across his dinner plate. Jabu retches until there's nothing left to come out of him anymore. He dry heaves and wails for the rest of the ceremony. He can't even cry. They took his eyes. One never knows what the naturalization priests are going to take from a quere quere. The only thing we do know is that they will take something that you love. I remember my conversation with Jabu before the ceremony. I won't be a quere quere anymore, he said, his eyes lighting up. When I'm a citizen, I will open my own gallery. I will spend my nights painting. Here I can finally realize my dreams. I can't wait to brag to everyone that I have a friend with a gallery, I said. I watch Jabu on the floor now. The corners of the priest's mouth twitch upwards in delight at the humiliation. Another quere quere shown his place. Even though I too want to slump to the ground, I move towards him and help him up. Come on, Jabu, stop it. I know it's cruel, but I have to be the stronger one. I can't let Jabu end up like Asha. God forbid he ends up like Asha. You're a citizen now, I remind him, giving him a squeeze. Forget your eyes. They are, were a small price to pay. They took, he whimpers, still unable to fully comprehend what happened. My eyes. You can find other ways to make art, Jabu, I say, pulling his hair back so he can rich some more. Others have it worse. Please, I don't want you to end up like Asha. Asha is, was our friend. While we all picked up the new language and tried to iron out our old accents like pressing the wrinkles out of clothing, Asha refused to learn the new tongue. It was her form of resistance. The new homeland would take from us anyways, Asha had said. Why not hold on to something? Then the naturalization priest took her language. No longer could she sing Stella Chiwesha and Leonard, and Leonard Dembo songs, songs that reminded us of the old weddings and parties from the homeland before everything was lost. She didn't eat for a month after she got her citizenship. We found her hanging from the ceiling on a Sunday night. It could be worse, I say again, trying to convince myself more than him. The naturalization priests don't only take body parts and voices. They can take away joy, names, love, beauty, songs, laughter, family recipes, music, and so much more. I shudder to think about it, but that is the price of citizenship. I take Jabu home to the two bedroom apartment we share with four other quitter quitters. Buy him a cane and make inquiries into getting him a service dog. I'll do everything in my power to ensure he lands on his feet. Our roommates know the weight of the taking. They've seen it countless of times. They saw it with Asha. So they allow Jabu to have one of the rooms by himself tonight. Jabu doesn't speak. When I sing Chirara Mwanawangu, a lullaby my gogo used to sing to me whenever I was restless. He keens until I can't bear it anymore. Perhaps if Asha was here, she would have done a better job of soothing him with a song. Before I bolt out of his room, he asks me, his voice a hoarse rasp of what it once was, what do you think they'll take from you? His question haunts me. My ceremony is in a week. If I don't go through with the naturalization, they will send me back to the homeland. I've worked so hard just to stay here for that to be my end. Whatever the priests take from me, I'll just have to live with it. I will sacrifice anything to stay here. Protests rage in the city. People carry placards denouncing the naturalization priests. On TV, a local man with a sneer on his face shouts, if it's so bad here, then go back to where you came from. I ignore the arrogance of one who has never known what it means to have a graveyard for a home. It is the arrogance of a man with solid earth beneath his feet. But I know that the ground we stand on is anything but solid. It shifts like the tides and swallows like quicksand. During the week, I try to forget about what's coming. I work under the table as a burner at the power plant that powers the city, harrowing work that no one else wants. The power plant has five chimneys like a coal plant. The chimneys are smoky eyesores that tower over the city. On the first day at work, I discover that it isn't coal that fuels the city. In the morning, a storage truck from the naturalization priest drops off large containers from the previous week's naturalization ceremonies. Each of the containers are labeled with a date. We unload the containers and burn whatever we find inside. My mind wanders during the burning as I toss limbs, recipes, tongues, songs, and marriage certificates into a giant furnace. 
The furnace burps and puts out smoke whenever I feed it something new. The furnace's heat is not comforting. I think of the monarch butterfly, native to this land, which cannot survive cold winters. The butterfly can travel as far as 3,000 miles to escape its death. The butterfly has no borders in its way, no papers to produce and no tolls to pay to stay where it's warm. The butterfly's flight is a beautiful thing, nature itself. Why is my flight from the winter of my life filled with shame? When I come across a container with the date of Jabu's naturalization ceremony, I am jolted out of my daydream. My hand shakes when I open the lid to find a pair of eyes sitting on a heap of other losses. Jabu's eyes. I reach for the eyes to burn them, but cannot shake off the unease, cannot ignore the churning in my stomach. What would Asha do? A voice inside me screams. Asha wouldn't burn her friend's eyes. Asha would throw a middle finger up and march out of that plant. But Asha is gone. A pragmatic voice in my head cautions me. Don't be stupid. I've already lost one friend, I say to myself with resolve. I will not lose another. I quickly glance at the other burners and the security camera before slipping the eyes into my pocket. I immediately take my timed bathroom break. In the toilet, I stash the eyes into my bra. Women in the old homeland would keep their coin purses in their bras to avoid pickpockets. No one ever thinks to search inside a woman's bra. My heart thuds in my chest throughout the rest of my shift. I now stop there. That is unfair for you to stop there. <laughs> oh man, that was amazing. The way you just make the words do what you do. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank happy. you, Audrey. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so happy you could join us. Um, speak on the inspiration, please. Yeah, so I wanted to um, explore, you know, the experiences of Black immigrants, uh, both in the U.S. and in South Africa, uh, where there's like a lot of Afrophobia. So the xenophobia is targeted specifically at other Black people and not um, other races or ethnic groups. Um, and so this world of the story is like a hybrid of uh, the USA and South Africa. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for sharing. I can't wait to read more of your work. I just read Friendship Bench. I love that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. Please share uh, anything that you're reading that you can share with us. Yeah, I recently read uh, Home is Not a Country by the poet Safia Hilo. So it's a novel in verse. I usually like, like it when poets attempt to write novels because they do something like interesting with it. So uh, it's a really, really good read. Would you mind dropping that in the chat? I didn't quite catch yeah. the, the title. Yeah, we'd, I'd love to check that out. Thank you again. All right, y'all. Next up, we have our fourth and final reader. So excited. Let me just switch gears real quick here. And, oh, let me pull up my bio sheet. And we're going to spotlight Paul or Yosef, if you could help me. We're going to spotlight B. Sharice. Our final reader. And there we go. There she is. Okay. Hi, hey, all right. So, raised an only child in Florence, New Jersey, B. Sharice Moore's love of literature was ignited by Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, what? And Judy Bloom's Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. Yes, love those. After earning a BA in English from Rutgers University, she began performing her poetry on stages throughout the country. Moore's poems and short stories have appeared in several anthologies and literary magazines, such as Chosen Realities, Summer 2020, Issue 1, Fantasy Magazine. These, be these bewitching bonds, Mermaid Monthly, and Faya's Black Speculative Fiction Magazine, oh, sorry, Faya Magazine of Black Speculative Fiction. At the present, Moore is a creative writing teacher the poetry editor at Faya Magazine of Black Speculative Fiction, the host of More Books with B. Sharice on YouTube, and she's a graduate student at McDaniel College where she's pursuing her master's of science degree in curriculum and instruction with a concentration in writing for children and young adults. I just have to pause here and just say, if y'all don't know about the homeschool middle grade first ever Afrofuturist textbook Conjuring Worlds, this is the woman that's in charge of compiling all, all the things. Y'all need to get the Afrofuturist textbook for homeschooling. I'm just saying. All right, back to her bio. <laughs> her 
debut young adult historical fan. Wait, let me just say that again. Her debut young adult histor. You better show the novel. Look at that. <laughs> This is her historical fantasy novel, Dr. Marvellous Jin's Odd Scholars, and it is available for purchase wherever books are sold, y'all. In her spare time, she enjoys reading to her terrific toddler, lovingly called Peanut, and engaging in intellectual spats with her husband, J. Al Farrand. She lives in Baltimore, Maryland. And we have dropped into the chat, y'all. This is the book trailer. Don't watch it right now. Watch it after this reading, okay? Get the book trailer link from the chat. Thank you so much, B. Sharice, you're up. Thank you so much for having me, Audrey. Um, yes. Shout out to all of the, the readers before me. You all were so amazing and inspiring. So um, thank you so much for sharing. OK, so uh, Dr. Marvelous Jen's Odd Scholars takes place in an amusement park in 1920. And um, the amusement park is called The Motherland. And um, Dr. Jin is actually a magician who is also a Garveyite, a follower of Marcus Garvey. And so inside of the Motherland Amusement Park during the Jim Crow era are nothing but exhibits and rides and pavilions that are dedicated to the continent of Africa. So. Here we go, um, we're inside and um, the character Elliot is discovering the amusement park or a portion of it for the first time. Right. Elliot took it all in. It was obvious that Dr. Jin had taken great care to the geography and history into the ball throwing games, darts and ring tosses. Even the popcorn, peanut, pretzel and candy apple stands had some interpretation of the red, black, and green motif. His gaze shifted from one corner of the room to the next and stopped. Mama cool sweets and cotton candy. A heavyset woman with a poof of white hair pulled in a giant bun shuffled around inside. A pair of odd looking spectacles with too many lenses dangled from a chain around her neck. He took a few steps closer his eyes settling on a mechanical arm inside a glass box near the woman's elbow. She used the arm to stretch and pull strands of sugar into minuscule ropes as fine as the hairs in the back of his hands. Each strand shimmered as if it had been scraped from a cave of crystals. The woman manipulated the mechanical arm like a weaver. It reminded him of the hats and scarves his grandmother crocheted while humming church songs in her old rocking chair. Though he didn't have an ounce of magical blood, there was something familiar about the process. He crept closer. Sticks of sparkling, sparkling red, black, and green cotton candy rotated of their own volition. Some spun round and round, others floated end over end. The sound of white noise and static assaulted his ears. Then as quickly as they had come, the sounds were gone. He crept closer and pushed his tortoiseshell frames up the bridge of his nose. After a few timid steps, he spoke. Mama cool? The woman looked up. That's me. Is that sugar? Elliot pointed to the sparkling threads between her hands. The woman narrowed her eyes, reached for the eyeglasses strung haphazardly around her neck, and put them on. Sugar, but not sugar. Sugar and spell, sugar and spell, sweets and tinks, tinks and sweets. She had a heavy voice like the gospel singers in his mother's church choir. Elliot half expected her to break out in song. She turned her back to him. On one of the booth's walls, he spotted aging photographs of people he didn't recognize, along with newspaper clippings, maps, brochures, and advertisements. Sprinkled in with the nondescript images were a black and white photo of an ever confident Marcus Garvey wearing an assured smile. The shelves were stacked to the ceiling with silver bowls, forks engraved with strange symbols, both foreign and familiar hung from wooden pegs. Elliot rubbed the hairs on his chin. Cotton candy, you choose. Red, black, green, or a combination. Mama Cool pointed at the rotating candy clouds. Elliot rolled back on his heels. What's the difference? An ain't, huh? A smile spread across her face. He bit his lip. Yes, ma'am, but ever wanted to know what it feels like to be a taint? She winked. To have magic blood? He looked at the woman with questioning eyes, but hush. 
Mama Cole put a pudgy index finger to her lips. Choose a color, red, black, green, or a combination. The more color, the richer the journey. Journey? He stepped back and looked at the sign above his head. Beneath it was a quote written in a neat cursive script. He hadn't noticed it before. It is crooked wood that shows the best sculptor, African proverb. Sculptor? He raised an eyebrow. She rested her chin in her palms. Yes, you are the sculptor. You cut a taint with a single bite. Her husky draw reminded him of red dirt and collard greens. Step into the shoes of a thief, a shifter, or a sage. She reached to the back of her boot, grabbed one of the strange forts and twirled threads of the sugary black cloud around its tines. Even as she held it, the threads pulsed to a rhythm. With her fingertips, she tore a piece from the larger cloud and popped it into her mouth. With the black, you become a shifter. There is no other feeling quite like it. Black is best. Elliot blinked as the woman's smooth brown skin and oval eyes stretched and darkened. She smirked as her features contorted, her button nose widened and flattened, her cheekbones sharpened and became more distinct. He gulped. Staring back at him was his father's easy smile. She spoke with his voice, low and rumbling. He could see the widow's peak at the top of his forehead. Stunned, Elliot stood rooted to the ground. In an instant, she shifted back and moved to the booth freely. He watched as she juggled black threads between her ringed fingers. Once she released her grip, the threads spun in midair. Next, she removed one of the red clouds from its box. Red. With red, you feel, see, and know. With red, you experience what it is to be a sage. Her voice grew louder and more dramatic with each word. She popped a morsel of red cotton candy into her mouth and held his eyes in a penetrating glare. You will have the revenge you seek. The cure is within reach. Before Elliot could reply, she shifted her focus to another rotating cloud. And the green. Yes, the green. She rubbed her hands together. The green is what it feels like to be a thief. Ride a camel through the pyramids of Giza. She pointed to the brochure of Egypt attached to a wall. Climb Kilimanjaro. She thrust a finger in the direction of a map of Zambia. Smell the Zanzibar marketplace. Travel through the then and the now. Her eyes grew wide as she pushed the map toward him. He turned it over in his hands. It was warm to the touch. All this in a bite? Yes, young man. She laced her fingers together. Elliot stared at the candy tree. And if I get more than one, I get the entire experience. How much? Mama Cool rubbed out one of her earlobes. Nothing and everything, free and not. How can something be everything and nothing, free and not? He grunted. It's impossible. What did it cost you to become an odd scholar? She peered over her spectacles. Nothing. I entered the competition and there's always a cost, young man. Time, energy, family, trust. For a moment, they stood in silence. Elliot stared at his shoes. That competition pushed you further away from your brother. Mama Cole folded her arms across her chest. There are things you should know. There's history here. She patted his hand. You have a journey ahead of you that will require you to know as much as possible. He shook his head. It feels like I'm in a maze. You're right. This place holds secrets and you must find them. She snatched another fork from the back and muttered an incantation under her breath. Then she pulled a page of newspaper from one of the booth's wall pegs. Its headline read, Who was Dr. Marvelous Jen? It was the same clipping his friend Thelonious had shown him on the day of the chemistry competition. What's your choice? Elliot took a look at the map and smoothed his mustache. He loved to travel. He certainly wanted to feel everything he saw. The shifting hadn't been appealing at all. Red and green. In a flash, Mama Cool folded the paper into a cylindrical shape, stuffed the cotton candy clouds inside and handed it over. Remember to breathe, young man. Breathe. It's a lot to take in at once. Here goes nothing, he mumbled. He closed his eyes tight and sunk his teeth into the sweet, fluffy threads. The white noise returned. After a rush of warmth, the air turned blazing hot as an August afternoon. He zipped forward, weightless, as bits of sand pricked his skin. Frames of ancient history zipped before him. A set collecting the fragmented pieces of her husband's body. Emotep gathering herbs and roots from the banks of the Nile. 
had ships in a golden press, breastplate riding on a chariot, Akhenaten writing a decree on papyrus. He was floating above an obelisk with a golden pyramid top attached with hieroglyphics. Carefully, he ran one of his palms over the markings. A buzzing vibration emanated from the glyph as if it were alive and breathing. He blinked. The spots behind his eyes morphed into wooden masks. Ebony-skinned people bowed, genuflecting from waist to ankle. Then came a star brighter than the night sky. An unseen force pushed him forward. He bobbed from side to side like a ball attached to a paddle with a rubber band. Now he's on, he was on the banks of a river. The Niger? No, an oasis in the middle of the Sahara. Then he sat astride a camel, his hump a hairy mess of matted gold. He held his nose shut. Thick jungle, endless green, heat, heavy humidity. He was sweating profusely, a waterfall tumbling into a massive pool. Birds gliding through the bluest sky he'd ever seen. Ocean, castles of white stones, spots, first black, then red. Red spots pulsing, whoosh. A vibrating force tugged at his navel. His heart beat slow to a crawl. He backstroked through the air that he could not swim. Home, his eyes flew open. Was it to your liking? Mama Cool chuckled her tongue, chuck, clucked her tongue and smiled. Elliot bent over to catch his breath. He removed his glasses and took out a kerchief. After wiping his lenses clean, he bit on the arm of the friends and stood silent for a moment, replaying the experience in his head. He traveled through time. He didn't believe what had happened, yet it had. He held, he held onto one of the boot's walls to support his weight. Intense, he said groggily. Good, she said. Wow. I was there. Okay. All y'all, I met all y'all. All y'all have just like teased it up. Like that is amazing. Y'all, the link is here in the chat to the book trailer. Please, please, Miss B. Sharice, speak on the inspiration. What, what how did this come about? Uh, the inspiration for this mm -hmm. was, thank y'all so much. Um, honestly, I found, I was, I, I'm in love with magic. And I just said to myself, oh my goodness, there had to be some black magicians, right? In the 1920s and 1900s. And so I honestly just did a Google search and I found a black magician named Black Herman, who was also a Garveyite. <laughs> And he actually had these super duper political magic acts where he would sell like talismans to ward off racism. And this is in the 19 teens and 1920s. Um, so I found, I stumbled upon him, then I stumbled upon another woman, uh, a female magician. And um, she had her own one woman show in the 1920s and the 1930s. And then the Probably the, the biggest discovery of all was the fact that I found out there were black owned amusement parks in this country during the 1920s and 30s. And I, I couldn't believe it. And one of the amusement parks literally was down the street from my old job in Washington, DC. And it was called Suburban Gardens. And it was built by H.D. Woodson, who was a black architect in DC in the 1910s, 1920s. He was also responsible for, for building uh, portions of um, the uh, uh, Union Station in DC. That's incredible. So um, I just stumbled upon all this rich history and, and I said, oh my gosh, so all this, this, first of all, this is magical. So what if these historical figures actually had magic powers, you know? And so I just brought them into, into the novel and um, and I kind of, you know, created this this world, this hybrid world, where you know we are celebrating the African continent, um, and you know, recreating these um, amazing, you know, things like Mount Kilimanjaro. There's a Mount Kilimanjaro coaster in my book. There's a haunted obelisk in the book. There's a second library of ten book two, and you know, the uh, the scholars actually visit Queen Nanny in Jamaica in the 1700s. You know, so. I go back and forth through time and I and I did my best to really honor um, both the continent as well as the diaspora and I did a bunch of research on African mythological creatures as well 
And I just signed my first traditional book deal for <gasps> Fangs, Feathers, and Folklore, which is the companion yes. of, of African mythological creatures. So that so that was that was the um the inspiration. Yep. Wow. One last question, then we gotta wrap. Thank you so much again to all of our readers. B. Sharice, what are you reading that you would like to share? If anything. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it. I loved everybody who was here. I can't wait to check all of your work out as well. And I love the friendship bench, nice. Lisa. I loved it. <laughs> One of my favorites. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, y'all, I have a book to share and then we got to go. So I'm reading, uh, I'd never heard of Caldwell Turnbull, but I am reading his novel, The Lesson. This is where a spaceship parks over St. Thomas, okay? And there's aliens and there's like, just, it, and it goes back to slavery. This alien has been here. Like, I need y'all to read this, okay? Caldwell Turnbull, The Lesson. Just pick it up, just get it. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our readers. I love you all. You are all so inspiring. Stick around for more of Beast Crawl. Yes, everybody, everyone unmute and clap and give applause for everybody. We want to hear it. Thank you so much. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Awesome. Incredible work. We'll see you out there on the crawl. <laughs>